Um, so what I'm going to be talking about today is POTS. Um, so this relates to EDS, but it occurs in patients who do not have EDS. Um, and what I'm going to be talking about today is actually, I'm going to be presenting the Cardiovascular Society, the Canadian Cardiovascular Society position statement on POTS, which is postural orthostatic tachycardia syndrome. This was actually presented last week in Montreal at the Canadian Cardiovascular Congress. So it's actually hot off the press, um, although it's not yet in press. So we were embargoed until we presented it a week ago. Um, and now we're able to put it out there to the public and it will be published in the next month or two in the Canadian uh, Journal of Cardiology. So this is the first time that we've had a Canadian position statement on POTS. And I think it actually is a great uh, reflection of the fact that this is a, a, a syndrome that has finally, it's not just percolated, it's kind of exploded to the surface. And finally, people are paying attention. Patients are finally starting to get practitioners with expertise in this area. Um, and hopefully we can, um, through things like the position statement, increase expertise, education, research into this important syndrome. So um, this is my disclosure slide. It looks like it's really full of disclosures, but in fact, nothing is related to industry or corporate uh, interests. It's all related to grants that I have for my areas of uh, interest in women and heart disease. Um, and so all of these are not for profit for uh, organizations like Heart and Stroke, uh, Women's College Hospital, where I work, um, and the government. So for this position statement, um, they actually had a group of us from across the country who have an interest and have developed an expertise or have been in there actually from the start to be able to work together and come up with really what we wanted was a framework for people to think about POTS, some guidance for family doctors, general cardiologists to be able to think, diagnose, think about starting treatment and educating their patients. So I've listed here the primary panel. We were the group that worked for two years to try and uh, produce this first position statement. And we sort of come from right across the country, from BC um, across to the east. After we'd put together the position statement, it then has to go to a secondary panel. And so they, the Canadian Cardiovascular Society recruited um, a, a group of reviewers from across Canada, the US and the UK. And what we had in this position statement is a little different to any other sort of society statements about POTS. And so it was a little controversial. We weren't sure, sure how it was going to be received, but we got it through. Um, and uh, we're pretty pleased that we've been able to produce something that's a little different than the standard POTS uh, information that you find in cardiac electrophysiology guidelines. So when we presented last week, I just wanted to show, we had our own disclosure chart, slide, and I want you to see that nobody actually had anything to disclose other than Dr. Raj, who has a CIHR grant in his work in POTS. Dr. Raj has been working in this area for a number of years. And if we look at the evidence of what we have about POTS diagnosis and treatment, I did the treatment section of this position statement. Dr. Raj was involved in just about every study um, in the treatment of POTS. Nobody else had anything to declare. We are not a group that is sponsored in any way, shape or form by industry. And um, I've shown what we presented as the session outline here, mainly because I've actually, with the permission of all of my co-presenters, taken their slides and, and put them together today to present to you. So in a way, it's a little bit of plagiarism, but we all put together the, um, the position statement and they have all said, yeah, go ahead, um, present with our slides. So uh, POTS. POTS refers to a syndrome and it's a syndrome that was first defined uh, by these two gentlemen here, uh, Ron Schondorf, who's in Quebec, and Philip Lowe. In fact, uh, Dr. Schondorf was on the committee for this position statement. And this was published in 1993. What we're referring to is the syndrome whereby you have an increase in heart rate of 30 beats per minute when you go from lying to standing. Uh, that's for adults. If you're uh, below 19 years of age, so 12 to 19, it's 40 beats per minute increase with change in posture. There should not be any significant drop in blood pressure. So we would consider a drop in blood pressure of greater than 20 
systolic and 10 diastolic. So there shouldn't be a significant drop in blood pressure. The symptoms um, should be worse when the patient is standing and they should get better when they lie down. Um, and these symptoms should be chronic. So for present for at least six months. So if we're looking at the cardiac symptoms and the reason why people like myself uh, get to see patients with POTS, it's because of these changes in heart rate and it's also that they get what um, we would describe as cardiac symptoms. So rapid heartbeat, palpitations, chest discomfort, they may feel short of breath, lightheaded, and often complain of very poor exercise tolerance. They also get a lot of non-cardiac symptoms, the most common ones being mental clouding or uh, POTS brain, they, it's often referred to as, frequent headaches, nausea, often the tremulousness, uh, fatigue is very common, and there's often sleep complaints as well. So what does this look like when we're actually testing a patient? So one of the things that we can do beyond standing a patient for 10 minutes in the clinic and measuring their heart rate going from lying to standing is to actually put the patient on a tilt table. And some of you in the audience may have even had a tilt table test done or will have heard of the, this as a test. And this is where we get the patient to lie on a table and we tilt the table up to usually between 60 and 70 degrees. And so we're simulating standing and we're stressing the patient against gravity. And then we measure the blood pressure and the heart rate over a period of time. So what we have here uh, on the left is a POTS patient and we have the heart rate, blood pressure and the tilt angle. And then we have a control, a, a patient without POTS on the right. And as we tilt, so you can see the tilt occurs here, in the POTS patient, the heart rate goes up and the heart rate is sustained, elevated until we put the tilt table back down to flat and the heart rate comes down. The blood pressure bounces around, but it doesn't, there's no significant drop or significant change. This is the control patient. There's a slight increase in heart rate, but nothing like what we see in the POTS patient with that tilt. So when we tilt the patient, the patient that has POTS also get significant symptoms. So this is a, a patient that um, has been tilted to 60 degrees, and this is a symptom score. And this, this in black is the control patient, this is the pot patient, POTS patient. And really, you could sort of superimpose this line for this patient having symptoms, feeling awful when they're upright, you could superimpose that on their heart rate when we tilt them. So symptoms with tilting going away when they lie flat, no real change in symptoms in the patient without POTS. We also know that patients with POTS have a significant uh, degree of disability and it has a significant impact on their quality of life. What I'm going to show you here and, and on the next slide is um, a, a measure of that degree of disability. So on this slide, um, these researchers have looked at a questionnaire called the SF36, which measures degree of disability. And the score is 100. The lower your score, the, the higher your degree of disability, the worse your quality of life. The green is a patient with black, uh, back pain. The purple is dialysis. And this is looking at both mental and phys physical disability. You can see dialysis, back pain is bad. Dialysis as a chronic disease is worse. Well, if you add in POTS, what you're finding is for both physical and mental disability, the score is around the same as someone with chronic renal failure on dialysis. So it's a significant impact on the patient with POTS. So when we put together this, this position statement, we were trying to answer a whole lot of questions that are out there for uh, health providers. Is POTS a clinical diagnosis? What kind of testing should I order? Does every patient need to have a tilt test? And I can tell you a tilt table test is not something that you really want to have as a POTS patient unless it really needs to be done. Um, should I look for something else? Is this POTS or something else? Does my patient need cardiac rehab? Is water and salt enough to treat this syndrome? Is there drug or pharmacological treatment available? Do I need to send my patient to a, spot, a POTS specialist? So we try to incorporate a lot of these questions into the guidelines. Just to give you an idea, so um, this, was, this is a case of a 49-year-old patient. It's a female patient, like most of the POTS patients. No significant past medical history, normal cardiovascular history and exam, 
had chronic diarrhea from C. difficile for one year and actually required a fecal transplant, was chronically um, depleted because of diarrhea and had a lot of these orthostatic symptoms, so symptoms on standing. Required intravenous fluid um, supplementation a few times, but was back to normal after two years after the, the uh, stool transplant. Is this patient someone that's got POTS? No. Case number two, you have a 22-year-old female, chronic pain and dislocations, frequent allergies, rashes, severe orthostatic intolerance, a couple of episodes of actual fainting, that's syncope, normal cardiac profile, heart rate greater than 30 beats per minute during an orthostatic challenge, so standing them up from lying to standing, um, conservative management without drugs, no improvement. Also got hypermobile EDS and mast cell activation. Is this POTS? Yes. yes. <laughs> okay. So um, these are the criteria that we have built into the position statement for the Canadian statement. Very similar to what was proposed back in 1993. So a sustained increase in heart rate greater than 30 beats per minute in adults greater than 19 years of age from supine to upright within 10 minutes of standing. Um, absence of that blood pressure drop that I talked about, presence of symptoms with standing, and these symptoms must be for at least, th we said, three to six months. Symptoms that may be associated with POTS include the lightheadedness, palpitations, tremulousness, chest discomfort. Other commonly reported symptoms that go along with POTS a long list, sleep disturbances, headaches, fatigue, pain issues, exercise intolerance and deconditioning, brain fog or POTS brain, POTS feet. I don't know if any of you have heard of POTS feet. We've actually seen a couple of slides today that really look like POTS feet. You, one of my colleagues said it's great when the patient comes in in sandals because you can, as they walk into the room and stand and you say hello to them, you can see their purple discoloration of their feet and their legs. That's POTS feet. Um, they often have frequent nausea and often gastrointestinal symptoms, which if you send them to a gastroenterologist, they'll be told they've got irritable bowel syndrome, but that's just a catch-all phrase. Now, in addition to those symptoms, that's sort of the typical POTS patient, there are those patients that have very debilitating symptoms. And these are things that uh, include gastric emptying problems. So they can have very intractable nausea and sometimes just constant vomiting, severe constipation and or diarrhea, problems with their bladder, including uh, retention or incontinence, pain, um, intractable headaches, not just migraines, which the POTS patients get, significant flash, flushing, anaphylaxis, severe food intolerances, and a variety of different neurological symptoms like numbness, tingling, pain. Now, these are the patients that tend to have EDS, uh, like we've been talking about today, mast cell activation disorders, autoimmune disorders. And this gets really confusing for patients and also for health providers, because they're trying to work out, well, what's POTS and what are these other symptoms? So what we did, and this is new, is we came up with a framework. Um, actually, I'm going to plagiarise a, a phrase from earlier today, sort of tra trying to make order out of chaos to clarify to people what we're talking about. And this is what we came up with. This is symptoms, so increasing symptoms following the um, x-axis and heart rate, the y-axis. What we have down here in the corner are healthy individuals, no symptoms and no real increase in heart rate withstanding. Then we have these three other circles. This circle here is a postural tachycardia, so increase in heart rate, of another cause, so it's not actually POTS. Whenever we see a patient with query POTS, we have to make sure they don't have some other cause, like the, the woman that I had in case number one with intractable diarrhea because of uh, an intractable infection, or someone with um, adrenal insufficiency, for example. This here, this circle here is POTS. So these are the patients that have the orthostatic symptoms and 
additional symptoms, but they're not really, really severe symptoms. And then we have this group that we've called POTS plus. And these are the patients who have POTS, but have other significant con conditions like EDS, mast cell, et cetera. And then down here, we have patients who actually get postural symptoms, but they don't get that profound tachycardia. They don't reach the 30 beats per minute with standing or on a tilt table, but they still have symptoms. And they may or may not have, um, it, they may just be postural symptoms without tachycardia, which we're calling PSWT, or they may be postural symptoms without tachycardia, but in the plus group, so they could have EDS. So we're hoping that the health providers can look at this, family docs, cardiologists, and try and sort of see what it is that we're talking about. POTS is a subcategory that can stand alone or it can be part of a bigger um, number of symptoms, uh, syndromes. Now, this is a really busy slide, but we had to produce an algorithm. Um, people looking at guidelines and position statements like algorithms, and so did our secondary reviewers. So it looks really busy, but basically what it does is it gives the doctor the opportunity to look and see where a patient fits um, in this algorithm. So do they have orthostatic tachycardia? Yes or no. If they have a resting elevation in heart rate, they may have what we call inappropriate sinus tachycardia, which is a dysautonomia. And there are some people in the audience with IST. Um, and then it goes across, yes and no, you can determine whether or not they have systemic disease, et cetera. If they have orthostatic tachycardia, do they have orthostatic intolerance? No. In fact, there are some people who increase the heart rate with standing by 30 beats or more, and they don't have any symptoms. So they really, we don't want to label them with a syndrome if they're completely fine. And I've had some patients like this, they have no symptoms. But if they do have symptoms, is it because of a secondary cause? Yes, then you go across here. Do they have systemic disease? Like you think they might have EDS, you follow across here. If not, then it's a standalone pot. So we're hoping this provides some clarity. Now, these are, this is just listing some of the conditions that can occur as the comorbid POTS plus. So it can be things like the cerebrospinal fluid leaks or severe migraines. Obviously EDS we've talked about, ME, uh, chronic fatigue, fibromyalgia, autoimmune disorders. So I see this in patients with, I see a lot of lupus patients as part of my other practice, patients with Sjogren's, um, Obviously, mast cell activation disorder we've talked about today and things like celiac disease. So a variety of different things can be in that POTS plus that causes that specific syndrome. So we've recommended as a group, and again, this is a, a group of cardiologists and internists, that we use specific hemodynamic and symptom criteria to define POTS in adolescents and adults so that we can avoid misdiagnosis. Because one thing I can tell you is you do not want to be diagnosed with POTS if you don't have POTS. It's, it's really bad for a patient to have a diagnosis of POTS when it's something else. I mean, imagine if that woman that I presented the first case was not diagnosed with C, uh, Clostridium difficile and was allowed to continue to have profound diarrhea and was treated as, she, as if she had POTS. Or the same if it's adrenal insufficiency. And for those of you that have been diagnosed with POTS, you also know that if, once you have the diagnosis of POTS, that's very significant. You go into the emergency department and you say you've got POTS, you're likely to have people go, don't know what to do with you, go back to your, your cardiologist or your internist. So having a diagnosis of POTS is important and it's got to be accurate. So what should we do for investigation of POTS? Again, we were designing this so that it would guide the, the family doctors and the cardiologists and internists to be able to get the ball rolling. Obviously, there's a history, the physical examination. We do need people to be doing five minutes of lying blood pressures and 10 minutes of standing every minute to be able to fulfill the diagnostic criteria of POTS. Um, and it can't be just your heart rate goes up when you stand up for a minute or two and it comes back down again, because that's really just a normal physiological response, particularly in young women. We need to do an ECG or EKG to make sure there's no significant heart rhythm disturbance and screen for any other causes that might be presenting as if it's POTS. And then what we've said here is other investigations are based on an individualized approach. It sounds like a pretty general statement, but it's there for a reason. 
because this is the algorithm that we put together for the people who are reading this statement and also for our, to um, satisfy our secondary reviewers. So you can follow this through clinical suspicion of POTS. You have your initial evaluation that I just talked about, which does include some routine blood tests that are important in, in these circumstances. Um, do they fulfill, the, does the patient fulfill the criteria? Um, and then diagnosis and management after initial evaluation, the patient improves, you don't need to do any further evaluation. These are the most simple POTS. They're the center of that POTS, not the POTS plus. For the POTS plus patients, they come into this part of the algorithm. And that's when you have someone that's got neurological problems, or you think they've actually got more of a significant disordinomia. They've got autonomic um, problems with their bladder and bowels, et cetera. So they're the ones where we're gonna be doing more detailed testing, like tilt table testing, autonomic testing, uh, neurological testing. So we've got that algorithm there for the doctors that are seeing women, largely women presenting with these symptoms. So how should we be treating POTS? Um, POTS is a syndrome that is really often multidisciplinary. Patients who have the least severe symptoms can probably be managed by their primary care provider, plus or minus, say, a cardiologist for support. Now, the patients with the more disabling symptoms may benefit from a multidisciplinary approach, and that's what a lot of us do. Um, and that can include the primary and subspecialty physicians, but also other health, allied health providers, and I've just provided a list there. Now, what's important when we're doing position statements, we have to base that statement on evidence or expert opinion. When it comes to providing multidisciplinary care, there's only one clinical trial that's been done looking at this. That was in kids. So um, we don't have hard evidence, but we certainly have expert opinion that this is, could be beneficial. The first thing we do is we look at non-drug treatment. That's our first, always the first line strategy. So that includes withdrawing medications that may be making the symptoms worse. So there are certain drugs that can cause um, water loss, salt loss, dilation of your blood vessels, um, fogginess of your brain, et cetera. So you've got to, we've got to look at what medications the patient's on and, and if it's safe to stop some of those medications or substitute them. Um, we encourage the patient to sleep in um, a head up position of about 10 degrees. And what this does is it means that you're not lying completely flat. So by being up by 10 degrees, about the height of a brick, it, you're activating your, what we call it, your baroreceptors. So you're actually challenging your blood pressure against gravity while you're sleeping. So that you've got, your reflexes are being activated. If you, when you go to sleep and lie down, and you're lying down for eight hours, everything that you've tried to do through your body's reflexes during the day have been reversed. So one of the things that happens is you pee out a lot of water and salt, for example. So by sleeping 10 degrees up, we're trying to maintain some of that water and salt. That's just an example. Um, avoid provocative stimuli. A lot of patients with POTS feel a lot worse in hot environments and with prolonged standing. There are some counter pressure maneuvers that we teach people um, and that's clenching your fists, standing with your legs crossed, clenching your, your bum and your uh, abdominal muscles to try and maintain your blood pressure in those circumstances where you feel like you might even pass out um, and you can't sit down. You're just in a position where you can't. Um, and then lower body compression garments. These are really important. They're often not well tolerated, particularly in people with EDS, for example, because of easy bruising and um, just a lot of abdominal symptoms. But if somebody can wear pressure garments that preferably full leg, and if you can up to the abdomen, because that's where your blood vessels stretch. And we were hearing earlier today that your blood volume can go from five liters to three liters by having it all below the waist. And you need it up here. A lot of my patients wear compression stockings to the knees. They're much better tolerated, but they're not very effective. So if you can wear waist high compression stockings, abdominal binders, athletic sleeves, sometimes people tolerate those, or Spanx. Um, when we presented last week, the chair of the committee asked me if, asked the audience if they knew about Spanx. Most people in the audience did. Um, 
for those of you who don't, you can get them in the lingerie store um, and they do provide that compression of the, the abdomen and some women find they can tolerate those to push the blood out of the abdominal blood vessels. Uh, the other things that we do with non-drug treatment, we increase blood volume through dietary interventions. So we recommend that if possible, increase fluid to three liters per day. And that can be any sort of fluids. And also to increase the salt intake to about 10 grams per day. It's a couple of teaspoons of salt. And there are a variety of different things that patients do to increase their salt intake. Um, and if you are uncertain whether or not your patient has optimized their salt and water intake, what we can do is measure 24 hour urine volume and salt content because it's a pretty simple equation. What goes in tends to be what comes out. And what I have found, I work in the hypertension world as well as the POTS world. My patients with POTS, they're all eating very healthy diets. They're avoiding the, the processed foods that have all the salt in them. Uh, they think they're doing a really good job with their salt intake and it's way below where we're aiming for. My hypertension patients tell me that they're doing a really good job. They're eating lettuce leaves and carrots and you measure their 24 hour urines and they're up there in the 170 range. We need to do a switcheroo but it is a useful tool. Um, and then the other thing that we do is an exercise program. So there is a exercise regimen that some of you may have heard of from uh, Benjamin Levine in Texas, Dallas, Texas. This has been actually evaluated in a clinical trial and it involves what we call recumbent or semi-recumbent, in other words, lying down exercises both aerobic and resistance exercises. And this has been shown in a clinical trial to actually induce remission in up to 50% of patients with POTS. And I need to say that this is the only treatment we have at the moment that induces remission when you're talking about the interventions, uh, non-drug and drug interventions. So it's really important. So if you look at those non-drug treatment recommendations, when you look at the evidence that we have for what we're recommending, um, there's, we have a strong recommendations here for salt and water and withdrawing exacerbating medications, but there's very little research into this. So low evidence. Um, exercise, however, we have strong recommendation and moderate ex uh, evidence since we do have a clinical trial of efficacy. So what about drug treatment? Again, drug treatment is for symptom control. It's not going to induce remission or cure. The drugs that we use for POTS are use what we call off-label. So they're actually not approved formally by Health Canada for use in POTS. Um, so that's important to know. Um, now the drugs may work on their own or they may work better when they're combined because they can be synergistic because they work through different mechanisms of action. And those mechanisms include increasing blood volume, increasing what we call vasoconstriction, so constricting the blood vessels, putting, pushing the blood up from your feet and your abdomen, um, and they reduce sinus tachycardia, in, in other words, reduce heart rate. So we use drug treatment in patients if they present with very disabling symptoms at their first presentation, we may start non-drug and drug treatment at the same time. Um, but there are a lot of patients where we optimize the non-drug treatment before we move to drugs. We also use them when we're trying to bridge people through that critical exercise program. Um, now, the other thing that I need to point out is that when, with most guidelines, the evidence comes from large randomized controlled trials. In POTS, it comes from sort of acute mechanistic studies, um, a few very small randomized controlled trials and their short duration, and also what we call retrospective non-controlled case series. So this was my patient, or this was a group of patients, this is what we saw. So it's, um, it's based on pretty scant evidence compared to most guidelines and position statements. So I'm just gonna go through the drugs that we use and many of you will have heard of these. So propranolol, this is a beta blocker, so it works to reduce heart rate through blocking receptors in the, uh, the heart's internal pacemaker. 
And this can help reduce the standing heart rate and improve exercise capacity and make some people feel better. Um, like all of the medications I'm going to describe, it does have side effects and with beta blockers, fatigue and reduced exercise capacity um, are the two most common. And of course, reducing exercise capacity because you can't get your heart rate up can be a problem if you're trying to do the exercise program. Um, so that's the beta blockers. Midodrine or mitodrine, depending on which part of the world you came from. Uh, this is a drug that causes the constriction of the, the blood vessels and pushes the blood up from the lower half of the body, the body to fill your heart. We've heard people talking about cardiac preload today, so filling the heart, getting the blood back there so you can get your cardiac output and uh, improve your blood pressure and lower your heart rate. Um, this is a drug that you can use on a regular basis. It does have to be given multiple times a day, which is a bit of a pain, but some people need that. We tend to avoid a few hours before you're gonna be lying down because it does elevate blood pressure. Um, and for some people, we actually use it as a, what we call a pill in the pocket. So instead of having it three times a day, on a day when you know that you're gonna be more symptomatic, that might be because the weather is really hot, it's summertime, it might be because you're working as a nurse and you're gonna be in the operating room, it might be because you're getting your period and you're always worse in that phase of your menstrual cycle. You can then use this as a pill in the pocket. You can use the beta blocker as well, but particularly the midodrine. Then there's pritostigmine. We've heard that mentioned a couple of times today. So this is um, a drug that increases the amount of neurotransmitter that's available to try and lower your heart rate through the vagus nerve and also compress those veins in the, the legs. It's often used in combination because it's synergistic with beta blockers and midodrine but it does have side effects. And the most common side effect is that it increases gut motility. So in those patients who have the diarrhea side of things rather than constipation, it may not be well tolerated and also those that have bladder problems. So I always start in a very low dose and use it usually in combination with something else to try and improve its efficacy. Then we have evabradine. You may or may not have heard of this. Uh, this is a drug that's used it works specifically on the heart's internal pacemaker, the sinus node. Um, and it can be used in patients who can't tolerate a beta blocker, but for whom the racing heart rate is really a problem. Um, again, it's used off-label. It's only been actually approved in Canada in the last, oh, I would say, two years. And it's expensive. Um, very little data about it, but there are patients who really respond well to the evabradine. When I use evabradine, uh, I make sure that I explain to the patient that we have little data, uh, explore the expense side of things. Um, and we also make sure with all of these drugs, but particularly with a new drug that we do no harm. And so we're very careful in who we treat and what drug combinations they might be on. Not many people have experience with evabradine. Then there's fludrocortisone. So this is a drug that actually works like a synthetic hormone that is produced by the adrenal gland. And what this does is it retains salt and water. Again, it does come with some side effects. We have to monitor your potassium because it, it retains sodium, but you lose potassium. And we don't really know why, but in patients who do have a lot of migraines as part of the POTS, it can make their migraines worse. I don't really understand the mechanism. And then finally, there's some drugs that we call sympatholytic, and that means dampening down the sympathetic nervous system. We're trying to uh, increase the vagal and decrease the sort of opposite side of the, the nervous system. This is used for the patients who have a lot of palpitations, tr are tremulous, and there are some patients who actually increase their blood pressure when they're standing. But it, these drugs do come with a lot of side effects. Now, um, I've I put intravenous normal saline here with, as part of a drug therapy, not a, because I see it as drug therapy, not a non-drug therapy. Um, some patients respond really well to IV normal saline, but we are very careful about who we recommend this for. Um, we recommend that it be used in the short term as a second line rescue therapy. So this is in patients who are very decompensated. So those that have the pox plus and they're vomiting a lot and they've got diarrhea, severe problems with their GI tract. Um, 
or bridging therapy. So if somebody's really uh, suffering, but we're trying to get them into the exercise program, they may need a short course of intravenous saline and to improve the compliance with the exercise and other medications. We don't recommend longer term use of intravenous saline because it requires an, a central line. So a line that goes into the, the central veins and that comes with the risk of serious infection and serious clots in those veins. And I do have a patient who has very severe EDS, severe mast cell. She's very debilitated. We actually had to give her um, a central line, a portacath for IV, um, and she did end up with a thrombosis. So that's why we're not recommending. It's really just bridging and rescue therapy. So this is the table that we have in the guidelines. Um, and this is the recommendation column and the, the level of evidence. And again, because we don't have big randomized controlled trials, we have pretty moderate ever evidence for the midodrin and the propranolol, and we have strong recommendations for them. But the rest of all these drugs, even though they're, they're used uh, regularly in patients with POTS, some patients respond to them, some of them are synergistic. We have, we have them as a weak recommendation and we, we have low evidence because of the lack of clinical trials. I just want to finish off with um, device or invasive therapy. This is for the standard POTS patients. There had been a move in the past for people actually to have their, um, their sinus node, what we call ablated or wiped out to try and reduce the heart rate. Um, and this we're recommending against because it can do harm in POTS patients. There are other patients with dysautonomias like inappropriate sinus tachycardia where we may have to do this because they run heart rates of 170 a lot of the time. But for the POTS patients, strongly recommend against, um, it can do harm. The Chiari malformation we've been hearing about today from um, some of our experts in the neurology and neurosurgery sort of sphere in the standard POTS patient, not the severely decapacitated patient, we're recommending strongly against doing decompression of Chiari malformation because it can do harm. So first do no harm. If the patient has the more simple POTS, we're not gonna be starting to do neurosurgical techniques on those patients. And then there was a move at one stage to do what's called liberation therapy, which is balloon dilation of the, the big vein, the jugular vein that runs down the neck here. This was in fashion at one stage for multiple sclerosis. And then it was realized that the evidence had kind of been falsified and it's no longer being used. And at one stage it was being suggested for POTS and at the moment there's no evidence for this and we strongly recommend against it. Again, do no harm in these patients. So I'm just gonna finish off with this last slide, which is again, a busy slide because it's the algorithm that looks at how we manage POTS. Um, and so step one, as I said, is always non-drug therapy. That's the salt, water, um, compression stockings, etc. Then the drug therapy. They can be simultaneous in those very disabled patients. And we have our first line, second line, and third line. So first line, if the patient has predominant problems with feeling their heart racing all the time and palpitations, that's going to be propranolol as a first line. If they don't tolerate or can't take it because it's contraindicated, you may consider evabradine. If the patient tends to run a low blood pressure, now probably 90% of the patients with POTS are women and premenopausal women. Premenopausal women run a blood pressure that's low. They're often told they've got low blood pressure, but it's actually healthy for young premenopausal women to have blood pressure that's lower than men of the same age and blood pressure goes up as we go through menopause. So these patients are gonna run pretty low blood pressures anyway. And if it's a little bit lower still with these um, orthostatic symptoms of the heart rate, they may be the ones that are gonna to respond to the midodrin and or the pyridostigmine. Then you have low blood volume. So those that are not getting in their salt and water. And I, you know, we are really push this in my patients, but some of you with EDS, for example, you're just not gonna be able to take in that much water and salt because of gastrointestinal problems. That's when you use the fludrocortisone and rescue therapy, the IV fluids. And then those who have mast cell activation or what we call the more 
sympathetically driven or hyperagenergic version of POTS, tremors and blood pressure goes up, a lot of palpitations. We may use these centrally acting drugs to dampen down the sympathetic nervous system. So that's the ultimate uh, treatment algorithm that we have. And uh, with that, I'll open up to any questions that anyone might have.